How do you feel when you connect with someone you love on Zoom? Have you felt the warmth of a familiar connection? The sound of your sister's voice? A glimpse of your baby grandson? Have you longed to be closer, to taste the birthday cake, smell the mulled wine, and throw real confetti? Zoom has brought the world closer in a year of unbearable isolation. Like WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, and others, it demonstrates our ability to live and relive emotions through virtual reality. It's a modern success story. But the tale it tells of innovation and stri striving to bring loved ones closer is also one as old as time. My name is Emily Clifford, and in this podcast on objects and emotions, I'd like to share with you two ancient Athenian pots and the emotions of love and longing that surround them. First, let us travel back and pick up another story, one that dives right to the heart of the relationship between objects and emotions. This story is told by Pliny the Elder, a Roman from the first century CE, who was a military man, a philosopher and a writer. It goes as follows, follows. There was once a young woman in ancient Greece who was in love with a young man. One day he was preparing to set off on a long journey, so she used a lamp to cast his shadow onto a wall and trace the outline of his profile. Her father, who was a potter, filled in the outline with clay. Her father, who was a potter, filled in the outline with clay, producing the first terracotta human likeness. Pliny offers this anecdote as part of an account of how the ancient Greeks invented the art of clay modelling. But it's also a story of two lovers torn apart and a woman who image, if not the body, of her beloved. Whether images are shown in clay or pixels, they offer a point of connection with those who are absent. Admittedly, Pliny the Elder was a Roman and he lived 500 years later than the Athenian pots that will be my focus here. But this anecdote from his collection of, writing, collection of writings known as the Natural History suggests that the way in which I'm going to talk about objects, art and emotions is very much rooted in an ancient as well as a more modern way of thinking. One power of objects and art is to reflect emotions and to stir emotions in the people that intellectual walk through the Ashmolean Museum to look at objects that I've selected for this podcast. Imagine that you're entering a gallery filled with objects from the Greek world. You're surrounded by marble heads and bodies, painted pots in black and red, and a towering bronze sculpture of a nude male figure preparing to hurl a weapon. Weapon, perhaps the god's use, with his thunderbolt. If we walk right to the back of the room, to the display case at the head of the staircase from the floors above and below, we find a large congregation of tall pots painted in white. These pots are a range of heights and are often shaped like slender, like slender jugs with a single handle on their narrow neck. In the ancient Greek world, these pots were known as lekithoi, the word lekithos meaning an oil or perfume terracotta jug. In 5th century BCE Athens, images on lekithoi were rendered in colour or outline on a painted white band. For this reason, we often call them white ground lekithoi. They are for the most part decorated with images of men and women and sometimes children. Now lekithoi were used in Athens and further afield in several different contexts, domestic and funerary, and over a long period. The ones that I've selected were probably deposited at or in a grave. Indeed many scenes on lekithoi from this period show figures at or preparing to visit a grave suggesting that these pots, among others, would have been brought either to pour a liquid offering on the burial ground and then, left and then left behind, or else brought specifically as a gift for the deceased. Some were also buried with the deceased. So let us look first at one pot dated to the 5th century BCE. On one side of the pot appears a woman in profile, facing to the right. She's painted mostly in outline, but her hair is black and her sleeves and the lower portion of her dress are filled with red. She holds before her, at waist height, a helmet with a long crest that falls in undulations towards the ground. We cannot discern the direction of her gaze, but the empty sockets of the helmet 
which is tilted back in her hands, appear to cast their blank stare upon her face. Before her, on the other side of the pot, appears a man in Athenian citizen robes, loose flowing clothing draped over his shoulder. Again, his body is mostly in outline, but this time his body is shown from the front, while his head turns in profile to the left. His gaze just might meet that of the woman that faces him. In his right hand, he grips a spear, the line of which runs right down the centre of the scene, dividing the two figures. Again, leans a shield, and around the upper border of the scene, the artist has painted a series of repeating patterns in spirals and crosses. What sort of emotions can we find in this object and its images? On the one hand, the artist has emphasised separation. Each figure is shown in isolation, divided from the other by the line of the spear. Yes, their eyes might meet, but they might equally fall on the helmet held in the woman's hands. Are both immersed in private grief, the object of their mutual attention, the armour, or perhaps the absent man who once wore it? We should bear in mind that neither of these figures is dressed in military clothing, but both hold weapons. On the other hand, these two figures are brought together on the space of the pot, and the objects they hold between them occupy a shared space of memory. A shared space of memory. Conceivably, one or the other figure represents someone present only in the other's mind, recalled by the touch of a familiar item the spear or the shield in each of their hands. So the pot illustrates both the pain and sorrow of division, but also the longing for connection and the possibility of meeting that desire through a coincidence of material objects and memory. If we cast our minds back to Pliny's tale of departure, of two lovers torn apart, we can see how the same sorts of emotions are bound up in objects associated with the funerary realm, where the departure of a loved one in death affects a similar, if more permanent, absence, and a desire for emotional connection via a memento. Many of us will have objects that remind us of someone else, from friendship bracelets to heirlooms of blooms of deep sentimental significance. We can think about Athenian Lekithoi in exactly this sort of way. Indeed, the images on the pots invite us to do so. In this example, the image of a figure holding a helmet mirrors the action of a real Athenian holding the pot and bringing it to the grave. Imagine holding the cold, smooth metal of the helmet, or touching the painted terracotta surface of the pot, faintly warmed in your hands. Both objects helmet and pot are palpably present. Both objects are surrogates for a loved one that embrace. On this note, let's look at another pot, positioned just in front of the other in the Ashmolean's display case. This lekythos has also been dated to the 5th century BCE. As on many lekythoi, a grave marker dominates the scene, framed by two figures in red drapery, drapery looking inwards. The marker on the pot is tall, taller than either adult figure, and is made of a narrow, upright rectangular piece upon a base of five rectangles laid one upon another like stacking cups. The painter seems to play deliberately upon absence and loss by contrasting the monument with the figures. The simplicity of the monument in outline with no colouring or ornamentation is stark. The blank spaces within its rectangular frames are evocative of the absent deceased. Moreover, the style of the drawing, a series of lines drawn around empty spaces, be really flat and two-dimensional when viewed alongside the style of the two figures that frame it. These are rendered in depth and bright colour, and so look, at least by comparison with the monument, like real people. This gives the impression that they, like us, look upon an image that's unlike them. them. These two real figures are looking at a drawing, just as we ourselves are looking at a drawing on a pot. Could this stylistic decision be a reminder that material objects, such as pots, are substitutes? Painted objects, not human bodies or monuments, 
just like more for lost loved ones. In this sense, though holding the pot in one's hands and gazing at its images might provoke the pleasure of remembrance and a sense of connection with those that have gone, it's also a painful reminder of the sorrow of loss. We find similar emotional, respo emotional responses in Greek tragic drama of this period. In Sophocles' Electra, Electra holds an urn, the memorial of her brother Orestes, and reflects that Orestes is nothing, a little substance in a little urn. In Aeschylus' Agamemnon, the chorus sing how urns and urns and ashes of the war dead are a mockery of the men that died. Before closing, let us think for a moment about the emotional impact of the entire case or group of pots. The first thing you might notice when you see the display in the Ashmolean is how many Lekithoi there are. For all the distance, all the distance and difference imposed by their neat arrangement and aesthetic impact in the bright glow of the museum glass case, the multitude also captures one aspect of what it might have been like to see these objects littered upon Athenian graves. This sort of scene is sort of seen as sometimes painted on other Lekathoi, where miniature painted pots are shown placed or fallen at the base of monuments. The sheer numbers perform, I think, a visual and material cry of woe, akin to the guttural wails of distress with their repeated sounds that we hear in Greek tragedy. Ototototoi and ayai. Each pot is an individual gift and each image may be different or a variation on a theme. But each is also part of a near homogeneous heap of objects of like shape and decoration. Image operation for the grave. Is this reassuring? A material declaration of continuity and remembrance by a community, as we see for example in an English churchyard, a collective statement of hope? Or does it perform sorrow with the impression it gives of futility and loss of identity? Loss of identity. What is one more pot on the pile? We cannot pin down the specific emotions felt by any individual mourner at the grave. Each person's relationships, loss and emotions are, after all, subjective and personal. But what we can are deeply emotional. And in some ways, the emotions that each pot reflects and stirs are not so different from the emotions with which we, as museum goers, relate to the collection. For centuries, the discovery, appropriation and collection of antiquities, of antiquities has been deeply steeped in desire. Desire to have, hold and display. Desire to forge a connection with the past, distant or near. To look through these objects and discover a lost world. Just think of John Keats's fantasy before another Grecian, before another Grecian urn. Thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who can thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. Our own longing is perhaps not so far from that of the ancient Athenian towards his or her lost loved one, or the painted figure on the pot who looks at a painted pot held in her hand and towards the figure painted upon the other side, perhaps another visitor, perhaps a memory she holds in her mind. In some subtle ways then, our own real or imagin some subtle ways then, our own real or imaginative pilgrimage through the Ashmolean to the collection of Lekithoi in their glass cabinet retraces the steps and relives the emotions of others thousands of years ago who made their trip to the Athenian cemetery and stood amongst a multitude of graves and pots.